Hello, okay. my name is Cruz. I'm a visual artist, writer, autism advocate, and current bomb fellow. Um, I'm neurodivergent, and for reasons too complex to go into here, I prefer to identify as a cyborg. In this series, through conversations with neurodivergent artists, we're going to be discussing some of the common barriers we face and exploring practical ways that arts organisations could make their operations and spaces actively welcoming and inclusive for neurodivergent people. Before we begin, I feel it's important to note that um, I intentionally, intentionally use identity first language rather than person first language. So I use the term neurodivergent person rather than person with neurodivergency. Um, I recognize that not everybody wants to use person first language and I respect other people's opinions regarding this issue. So we're very happy today to uh, welcome artist George Moore, uh, who's going to explore or help us explore issues around gender, sexuality and uh, neurodivergent inclusion and why autistic people are so often identified as rude or why our voices and our identities are sometimes not validated. So welcome, George. Thank you. <laughs> and we're gonna start with um, George taking us through some of his uh, artwork and talking about his practice. Um, I think it's really important in these talks to really show the work of the artists that we're discussing uh, these issues with because it's really important that we are seen as professional artists. Um, and so take it away, George. Hello, uh, my name is George Moore and uh, I'd say I'm a multidisciplinary artist, kind of make work about uh, how society navigates affection and intimacy and how we kind of seek out validation, emotional reverence in society under modernising technology. And um, my work ranges from photographic installations, sculptures, uh, paintings, uh, photographs, sometimes poetry, writings, sometimes do a bit of articles, writing. And um, I'm interested in how um, examining queer narratives, gender, neuroscience, and the links between art and science in general. And I like to blend imagination, evidence, and autistic vision, and seeing how all of those can overlap and intertwine with each other. Um, so if I talk about this work here, which is called Precious Boys, which I made in 2016, which I installed at Turner Contemporary. Um, this work explores how the huge pressures that men kind of go through regarding body image and how men may be affected by social media and how the ability that we edit our images and create ourselves online how our, our, how our identities become sublimated with our image, how we project it online. And I was interested in how in post-industrial towns around the UK, that seems to be more of an issue, which I kind of looked at through Google trend searches. I used data on graphs and trending and, and searched online certain keywords like protein, torsos and steroids and found that those searches were highest in areas such as port towns like Plymouth, London, up in the north east and that's also areas where there's high rates of loss of life for men due to suicide as well. So this work was kind of inspired by William Blake's poetry collection songs of innocence and experience based on a poem called uh, cradle song and little boy lost and i was interested in how in victorian times a lot of the stories often portrayed as being childlike theme but actually they had very dark undertones to them 
a lot of hidden narratives in the same way that Alice in Wonderland is often seen as a child's story, but actually it's not, it's really written for adults. For example, in the moats where there's bodies around in the moats and how that, how we really kind of teach children about through nursery rhymes, which is almost like a form of conditioning. But this work was kind of representing how in my local area, in the landscape, um, there's been a recent increase in the loss of life of young men in the woodlands, parks, and the railways due as a result of the increase in the rates of depression in men. So this kind of represents the kind of abdomens of those men seeking out emotional reverence or solitude. These sculptures are made of plaster and then covered in gloss paint. Uh, this one's originally like a prototype because I actually envisage this one being actually installed in a room in its own under dim lighting with sounds inside the sculptures that interact with an audience if they come into the environment. And they're set on um, alum salt pigments and salts and sugars that change in colour over time, which is kind of exploring how um, old age kind of Victorian medicines that we use to treat uh, children's pain relief medication and also blending with um, kind of certain treatments that were used during people who had HIV with animal salts. So I'm interested in how the kind of aesthetics of medication has been used throughout history to explore kind of treatments as well. Uh, so this work is called Disposition of Digital You, which kind of links into one of the previous works. Now, so I made this work for my solo show at South End Museums. And this was exploring how that similar theme of people seeking out affection and sometimes the dangers of that, because there's this kind of, well, a lot of, some people don't realize is there's this, some people take for granted the visibility. For example, with heterosexual people, there's that taken for granted that being able to kind of, there's that visibility in society, whereas for people who are, maybe who are queer, they might have to use dating apps and that in order to seek out connections for each other or due to isolation. And, but there's also that kind of sense of danger and risk with that as well. Because with that huge pressure sometimes for people to seek out affection on dating, kind of, um, translate into violence and danger. So in my, I think in this work was just pointing to how in Barking and in some areas of Essex where there have been instances of people who had been um, groomed through the Grindr app and had then been drugged and abused by older men. So this work was made in re response to that and it was also also how people reduce their body to now just being a an image or sections of images because that's how sometimes we regard our self-worth mm -hmm. because it's almost like a currency attached to a body now and it's like our identity has been kind of almost sublimated in certain sections of society so I installed this work inside the South Museum alongside two other paintings. One of them was a homage to Bartolomeu Esteban Murillo, which was an oil, a Victorian oil painting of two beggar boys on the streets. And I was interested in how, when you look at vulnerability of view throughout history, the intensity of it, I mean, 
the vulnerability has always been there. So when you look at beggar boys on the street, there was the fact that they were homeless, they were poor. And now I think that vulnerability is now exists online. But I think that kind of risk is a lot more intense. And I displayed this work alongside that with a Joshua Reynolds painting, which is based in allegory called Education of Love and how we how online media and televisions are communicating through especially reality programs as well, like Love Island and how what is essentially considered to be worthy in someone, like their body, on how that in the same way allegory paintings communicate um, a, a message. And I was interested in how reality programs are now doing the same thing. It's and like this... the body has no context now as well, isn't it? Like when people see you on Grindr or Tinder or whatever, it's like it's it's there's no context there. It's just the body as an object or as a you know, as a kind of yeah, an object I think is the best way to describe it really. I really I can see that with the way that you've you've done this piece of work as well. Like the face is gone, but that 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 contacts that person as being you know an individual. I think it's I think really as well. Hard to see young people today. A lot of I find a lot of online profiles now. The, it's been reduced simply now to just images, very edited images, sections of images. Uh, your, what your job is, your age. And what you often find as well, there's almost like very limited types and ways in which we project ourselves online, which is almost to communicate status or self-worth. For example, it will be associated with the, the gym body or how we communicate our status due to our job. For example, a lot of people would share travel pictures online because travel is a way that we say we're quite cultured or how we're quite, we might communicate with we have money or it's very, I think it's a lot more intense in queer culture, this kind of self-worth because a lot of people require this kind of validation online to seek out approval and validation. So there is a lot more intense in in queer society. Mm -hmm. So you'll find a lot more images of torsos and that often be taken in gyms. But what a lot of people don't know, especially on Instagram, is that we no we no longer know what image is real and what's not, or what's been edited and what's not. Mm -hmm. Even when it comes down to a torso on Instagram, it might not be edited digitally, but you aren't aware whether the person has taken steroids or not. So it becomes the point where there's two levels of edited, whether someone's actually taken steroids to manipulate their own body, or whether they've manipulated their body using digital technology. There's like almost two levels. Mm -hmm. I was quite interested in how um, Jean Boudrillard's idea of the simulacra and I feel like now there's this kind of two levels of the simulacra because of digital technology and also how people are adapting their bodies through bio products as well, mm -hmm. like testosterone and anabolic steroids, which people are buying through social media as well. Well, one of the questions that I was going to ask you, I'm going to ask you now, actually, because I feel it ties in with this. And this was the, the question about identity. Um, and how our identities allow us to be descriptive of our complex selves. But in a way, almost, the identities that you're talking about right now are, are, are almost limited identities in a way. You know, this is, um, this, is my, this is my identity as, I don't know, uh, a traveler, you know, and, and it, uh, 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 an exciting, fairly wealthy young person who's just been to Goa and had an amazing experience doing yoga. And it, it's sort of quite a limited experience, I suppose. Um, 
So yeah, I was going to ask you the question of um, about identity and finding a place of belonging and whether or not you feel accepted uh, and represented in the arts as a as a queer and autistic person but or neurodivergent person but I don't know if that question is quite the question I want to ask you now but I do feel that it's it's kind of relevant at this point looking at your work this notion of identity and what what does that mean to you as as a queer uh, autistic person or person with autism I think for me there's like two sections within that question because I find that in queer culture people with disabilities are I think in also, in also other areas of society as well you're either seen as a you're either seen as a fetishized object or as a case study but when it comes down to the actual equity in society it's not really there so um, when you look into um, queerness through history, especially since the 1980s, I find that when it comes to disabilities within queer culture, it's normally only limited to, for example, mental health or those that were affected by HIV and AIDS, the crisis of 1980s, because that was significantly affected so many people in the same way when you look at the coronavirus now it's affected so many people so that accessibility has been so much more immediate like there's a surge in it at the moment but when it comes down to um, for example very intersectionality within kind of queer culture I find that is very not non-existent I think it's because it requires people to really kind of unlearn their conditions, way of thinking, or how people are portrayed in the media. So there's examples on Netflix where people are, that you know, disabled people are being commissioned to produce um, programs around deafness and someone being gay but if that isn't translated into queer spaces for example encouraging people to learn British Sign Language there's no equity yeah. it's not being translated it's to me that's just saying you're just it, it feels like deafness then is being fetishized for someone else's product and you're becoming a commodity as a disabled yeah. person. I felt that many times as an autistic person, that you're commodified. And through your experience, others make money. Through your experience, others are able to, to generate income, uh, which sometimes doesn't always go towards the person with the disability. So, yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I think that notion of... of ourselves being fetishized but also commodified is really one that's quite powerful and one that I would like organizations to note and be aware of in working with disabled artists. In 2017 there was a huge kind of variety of queer shows that have been shown because 2017 was the 50th anniversary of decriminalization partial decriminalization partial decriminalization of male homosexuality but when when we look at a lot of the examples around social that were shown for example at Tate queer British art show or in um, there were shows about coming out and that there wasn't can you hear me yeah can you hear me still yeah my thing went um, there was like there wasn't much intersectionality within these queer shows and I think that's more to do with as I said how the HIV and AIDS kind of 
over, has overtaken disability politics within queer history. It's not much, it's not extending to other people with other disabilities. I think it's due to lack of exposure or representation within the arts because a lot of queer history books don't seem to um, explore those thematics really. Mm. It's interesting, it's, it's a huge subject. So this one is all about synaptic pathways and neurotransmissions in thought processes. This was all about kind of exploring in a way the barriers that are upheld within queer spaces. A lot of the ways in which people, the platforms that are designed to connect queer people, they're very ableist because a lot of dating apps and that they're quite, they don't allow space for a lot of neurodivergent people, specifically people who might have sensory issues or autism. Like some people require that safe space and a lot of digital platforms don't really allow that kind of that patience or the ability to people to really connect authentically, especially when there's a lot of pressure online. That's why a lot of, a lot of queer spaces, for example, like gay bars or nightclubs and that, they don't, they're not really um, inclusive enough for people who might have sensory issues or people who might require more relaxed environments. So I was interested around the kind of the politics around queer spaces in general and this work was all about ex uh, exploring touch and intimacy through phot photography. And I was using cameras to hyper-focus on parts of bodies like limbs and using micro lenses and studying the movement of limbs and how the light is refracted because I see that as a metaphor for the ways in which somebody might who might be autistic for example might experience that touch as being quite hyper intense or that sensory might be a lot more um, there's two I think hypersensory and hypersensory because a lot of people find that that autistic people are very, we experience things a lot more intense, but a lot of people aren't aware that actually we can experience sensations as very, like there's nothing there. Sometimes we require a lot more stimulation, sometimes we don't at all. That's why I find people aren't always understanding that if someone who's autistic, they might actually, like, I actually do like going into like nightclubs and that because. The, the sensations of the music actually drown out everyone's conversations. You can't hear people. Whereas when you compare that to another environment, there's, um, for example, yeah, a restaurant or something, is that like you can hear everyone's conversations. So actually some spaces are a lot more inclusive than others, but it's all, it's very much a personal experience. Yeah. But with this, these works, I was exploring how the terminology of affect touch and and another terminology called discrimination touch how which is very relevant to now of the social distancing restrictions and the reasons why um, some restrictions are different for people who are autistic because when someone's experiencing emotional distress and they might have a neurodivergent condition they might require a lot of physical intense touch in order to relax those um, feelings so I was interested about how um, certain demographics and minorities are more affected by the COVID pandemic than others because we might experience more isolation as a result of them. Yeah. This was another example. This one's called Juvenile Addictions and this one is a similar approach where I was photographing um, fabrics and items of clothing that had been used in gym rituals and exploring how kind of the gym culture and how that's 
becoming a ritual within almost gender performance in a way and how we communicate that on online. So it's interesting in the fabrics that have been saturated with body fluids and also using gym products such as proteins in some of my paintings. And I also code some works I was making um, poetry recitals and the backgrounds I was coding the images to colours that are being used on dating apps. For example, with Grindr, it's, a, it's, a, it's an orange colour and I was coding that using Photoshop and placing that on the background of a poem recital. But it, it was speaking about the insecurities of men online and how there's instances where online I have, some people will, how people portray themselves online is, is almost a performance in a way. And we no longer know what's real, what or what's not real. And how some people might use it as a way to kind of manage our emotions, like anxiety, stress or depression through validation or through seeking out um, interactions online. But one, a good book I read was called Velvet Rage uh, by, I think it was Alan Downs that was written in the last century. And it was about how gay men, for example, might use um, casual sex or drugs as a means to manage our emotions. For example, high levels of anxiety or depression. So this is a recent work called um, Intimacy in an Age of Physical Absence 2020, which was produced during the lockdown. And uh, this is part of my first like, bursary from Colchester, in Colchester. And this was a work that I made that kind of reflects that kind of intensity and pressure experience in isolation. And I noticed that on dating apps, as the lockdown kind of went on, I noticed a huge surge and increase in the use of online mobile dating apps and how that despite the restrictions, people were still wanting to meet up. Because when, if you cut off some people's um, pathways in order to get emotional connection they might that will significantly increase isolation and certain members of society, for example, people with disabilities, people from the queer, um, LGBTQ people, we might be more predispositioned to those feelings, which were, which were the case even before the pandemic. And where we were seeing those huge kind of restrictions being in place, those feelings were a lot more intense. So this work I produced as a result of that, which was the figure was produced using protein supplements, protein powders, flavorings, and I used collaged images from newspaper cuttings that were about the COVID pandemic at the time and the fears of society around the virus, which seemed quite, um, because there was a lot of unknown at the time, so that fear was a lot more intense. Do you feel there's um, a conflict for um, autistic people in during lockdown, in that there's this, um, I wrote a piece for a, a commission I got right at the beginning of lockdown about being a hermit, and there was definitely an element of myself that was so joyful in the fact that I didn't have to go through the, the agonies of social interaction, but then when you're talking just now about isolation, it was also a very strong sense of isolation. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Do you feel that that's a kind of a dichotomy that a lot of autistic people may feel in that you wanna socialize, but you can't, or you, it's very difficult, or there's a sense of wanting to be, needing to be isolated to be calm, but wanting to be social to, because we're human beings and, you know, well, most people are. I might not be, but I think for me it was the 
I think there's two polarized experiences of it. And I think it was a type of communication that was the problem. Whereas I, I think there was suddenly such a huge surge in digital communications that for me, that was too much. It was just like, I, you know, I wanted to limit that. And but for me, it's when you compare before and after, there's this, um, I think to me, I can only speak from the experience of how it is around in queer spaces, but it's often impacted by people's perceptions of autism and how um, that's informed by the media who tend to only focus on the very narrow experience of it. And whenever I talk to other queer people about that who aren't neurodivergent, they tend to have a lot of prejudices around that. And because they don't they don't feel that they can I think it is there's a communication barrier, but also they don't feel like we want that kind of social connection or intimacy. So I've sometimes felt ostracized by that. Yeah, and isn't it easier to um, to just blanket all autistic people with wanting to be hermits? And it's much easier to just go, oh, well, they like being on their own rather than making the effort to find out how we communicate and how communication works best for us. Yeah, and I think going back to disability representation in queer culture, I find that where it's around awareness of mental health, it's often because it might be as a result of how society oppresses people who are queer. When it comes to like disabilities around deafness, those with neurodivergence or learning disabilities. I sometimes feel like this might be problematic to say, but there's the way in which it's because it requires people within the community to actually learn or to learn the communication or adjustments or approaches to actually communicate with us, as opposed to being simply around awareness, which is why when people might commission projects from disabled people, it's all very well representing it on the screen, but if that's not being translated into a, a space to learn Makaton or British Sign Language, there's not actually real equity in society that's been produced as a result of those opportunities. For example, when Netflix put on a show about called um, I think Atypical, yeah. it's very much fetishized white cisgender heterosexual young man yeah and those experiences are just so narrow and feel very it was a lost opportunity to actually really pursue uh, a space where they could have explored other stories of intersectionality within that it community. Feels very, it, feel, it felt very limited and unreal for the autistic experience anyway because I think a lot of I'm talking here about autistic people not the wider neurodivergent community, but a lot of autistic people would not necessarily identify as uh, just straight binary. Like I think, I think most maybe autistic people have a much more flexible idea of their identity than um, perhaps the the uh, non-autistic community realise. Yeah, I mean. I mean, I'll talk about that later in the questions, but there's a lot of people don't realize that um, there's been a lot of studies, clinical psychology studies into people identify as autistic. And it's like we're three times more likely to identify as not being heterosexual and 70% more likely to be um, more likely to identify as being LGBTQ plus because we're more likely to reject societal 
the dominant voice within society and more likely to express ourselves is how we see ourselves. Yeah. Because we don't, we don't really, in the ways that other people might try to fit in, for example, this whole idea about how we might change our bodies to meet, you know, societal tribes, you know, for example, that the gym body, we're more likely to be more expressive in how we and how we express our gender or express our identity as such. Yeah. That's why I think it's still the intersectionality within the autism community in terms of how it's presented on the media. So it's so much more to travel in terms of where it could go. Mm. Because the ways in which certain demographics might struggle to actually get a diagnosis as well is affected by different sectors of society as well and, and gender and race and also socioeconomic reasons as well. Yeah, we, we have um, an episode coming up um, where a group of black neurodivergent artists are going to be talking about their specific experience as well and how how they are um, welcomed and accepted and or not in the art world specifically. Mm. So the first question uh, I have for you, I think might possibly be um, redundant now, but I'll ask it anyway, because that's what we had on the list and I do like to go through the list. So George, <laughs> How do you identify and does your experience of being autistic inform how you are perceived by others? Uh, I think being autistic, I don't always see myself as cisgender and it's kind of, I see very, I feel very flexible about how I see myself. And I think sometimes I feel like it's just, I think there's a lot of terminologies, terminologies within gender variance and sexual orientation, but it's almost sometimes I don't feel like I align with any of them. It's almost like I just feel like I'm just a being. I don't see myself as... It's hard to describe and I just simply just see a person as like their inner soul and that's why when I was talking back about how we, how society kind of is conditioning us to see people through acromental worth, I just don't see any of that. I simply see someone's inner being. I don't, and I feel as I'm getting older, that's becoming more and more apparent to me. So I suppose I don't, I think if someone, if I was to have to align it, I'd, I'd see myself from being non-binary, but not. I'm flexible within that I feel very like and how I experience my environment massively affects that so for example with um, I think a lot of people would see the autism spectrum as being something like this for example like language motor skills executive functioning perception and sensory and that's how a lot of people would, or people who aren't necessarily autism understand the spectrum as being like a straight line and we fit on that. People who are autistic will see it as this, kind of all these different factors that affect our ability to process an environment, communication, motor skills. But I, I find that for me personally, this is how I experience it. I see it as like a matrix that constantly oscillates and changes every day. And the only way I can describe it is that um, it's like, I feel like it's almost like a horonerous Bosch painting. That there's inside, there's just so many multiple outcomes in terms of how I see forms, how I see layers, how I see myself within that. And it was interesting when people recently it was announced 
that the makers of the Matrix film had said it was an, that the films are an allegory for transgender people, which was interesting because I wrote a short visual essay for the National Autistic Society, and before that was announced, I described it. Me personally, I describe the films around this as as a matrix. So I've always aligned with the films like The Matrix or Blade Runner, and about how there's different layers within that, and how my experience of the environment actually informs how I see my own gender and sexuality, and how that might be might be changed, and how it's constantly moving and oscillates. Yeah, I really hear you because uh, I mean it's one of the reasons why I self-identify as a cyborg because I feel being a, an, an ordinary human being kind of isn't enough for precisely that reason. Like, am I female? Am I male? No, but I am, I'm a mother, so I guess yes. But then <clears throat> the idea of the, the the quality of the way that I see the world, the layers, the pan test that I'm constantly working through that's about sound and vision and trying to always use human English language to translate what my brain is seeing versus what I have to tell you. It's so limited. It's so small compared to these layers of, you know, and maybe everybody feels that and it's got nothing to do with us being autistic. I mean, I don't know. But um yeah, I hear you. I, th I love this idea of the matrix and this idea of, because we're, we're reacting a lot, aren't we, to our environment, to, to, to our sensory input, as well as whatever we might be feeling in terms of our relationships with other people and how we have to identify um, in our sexuality and our gender. And, and when I see something like this that you've brought up right now, and when I hear you talking about your your experience as an autistic queer person, it's so beautiful. I think it's really, really beautiful. And I want to hear more of these beautiful, complex, interesting voices that our community has. So, so thank you for sharing that. I think um, I would, there's a... I found out there was about um, I think 40,000 people uh, who identify as both being autistic and LGBTQ plus in the UK. But when you look into gender variance, that, I mean, before that figure around being autistic and LGBTQ plus, that represents about, I think, 0.06% of the UK population. When you look into gender variance within it, that, that figure could be 0.01%. So I think that's mainly why the representation isn't there, because our percentile is so, so, so small compared to the rest of the population that it means that I think that movement for us to get into those positions of representation is going to take so much more longer to happen, I think. Mm. I agree with you, but I think it's, I think it's really important because I think it's, um, it's exactly what the modern artist does, isn't it? It's, to show something that other people might not know about, be aware of, be able to identify or, or, or um, put, put, put words to themselves. So it feels like as an artist, you should be welcomed with open arms uh, to organizations. Um, do you think it's important to find mutual understanding with people who don't share your identity though? And, and if you do, what is it that you, in your work that you bring uh, that makes it more meaningful for, or makes it meaningful for wider audiences? Um, I think with a lot of my work, my practice often starts from a medical or a psychotherapy approach to my work. And my work's quite sociological based. So even though my identity might be a lot more specific compared to other people if that's the way to describe it um, my work can be quite general in terms of everyone can relate to body image in a way everyone can relate to um, sexuality everyone can relate to experiencing these images within society everyone can relate to affection but my work 
explores the different approaches to that and I'll compare those approaches so for me it's a that I, I see my work as creating a bridge rather than a comparison as such right yeah and what was I saying I think think as well that um, because my work takes a lot of discourse from medical and therapeutic practices I often blend imagination evidence which I source through social media and other digital platforms to then make the work so it often comes from a very mutual place anyway mm. absolutely because you're sitting in the middle of it all experiencing it yeah um, so as neurodivergent individuals, we're seeking, still seeking acceptance and tolerance and understanding and equity from within the art sector and wider society. So to look at it from another side, what do you think neurodivergent artists can offer that is that arts organisations really would benefit from? What are we good at? I think without fetishizing the whole thing around gifts, because I find it quite problematic, but I think we're good at assessing information and context and the way in which we have a different thought process to the dominant voice within society, which is neurotypical, is that we can form new or alternative perspectives within collections, archives, networks, so we were able to form new or enrich practices within arts, which might help a organisation if they're trying to reach new audiences or to find a gap within their programme that they might not realise. And which would come on to the fact that intersectionality within autism is still very small so there's still a lot more opportunity within that that can be approached within arts organizations yeah for example okay, like, sorry. sorry so for example like um around how which, are, which has been explored another one about how in black culture a lot of black people aren't being diagnosed as being autistic and why is that and or how the added problems within um, queer culture around how autistic people are received or under, accepted by other queer people or how because I find that even as queer people the way we might express ourselves is often not accepted by our society but then how is someone with a disability and how they express themselves how is that received by other queer people there's two layers to it and often I find that that ability to express ourselves and how people are being found and dis discovered as such is often through social media. So um, how we get peop uh, disabled queer people who are being um, scouted for like fashion projects have been found through social media because that is the most almost the most democratic form and platform that will be in which we can actually um, express or project ourselves online mm. because it's incredibly accessible and it's public domain now. Yeah. There's less barriers that which we have to overcome to get to that point. Mm. And I think that's the next challenge with our organisation is kind of... I was just going to... Sorry, I didn't want to stop you in the middle of the sentence, but... Um... I just wanted to say about that, that I think there's something really great about using social media from my point of view is someone who would be from an arts organization contacting someone. When I'm contacting them via social media, I feel much more like I'm coming into their space and that I need to adhere to and sort of 
basically it changes the, the dynamic of this of the communication i find you know i'm coming in and i'm saying i want to talk to you on this on this channel so i don't know there's something psychological about it that changes the way that i might approach things which i think is good because it puts it it levels out that dynamic which is usually like a curator or producer coming to you and being like oh do you want to do this for me sort of changes that slightly which i quite like in in, in some ways yeah i mean that's kind of how i designed my website for me that my web the home page of my website is how i sometimes see my environment moving around the background so a lot of people might say oh but i can't read the text properly but then it's sometimes how i experience me going into a space or an environment is it's like that forcible change that unfolds someone into an environment because i want them to see some kind of mutual understanding in a way and how I might archive material online is sometimes how I might, yeah. how I might engage with an arts organisation when I've done, for example, with South Museum, they allowed me to look through their collections and archives. And I've, I actually created the show with another creator as though it was a mind map, a network in itself, it, not necessarily in a traditional format, because that's how I might engage with a mass load of information. It's brilliant because it's almost it's like subversive. Like you're going into the website and actually you're communicating these things on a on a different level. And I think that I think from listening to this whole conversation so far, and um, there's a lot of it about um, the dynamics and the power structure of like an organisation versus an individual artist and how we need to sort of change that. And I believe that that is shifting. You know, every time I receive an accessibility document from somebody or someone telling me on the bottom of their email how they want they will communicate with me it it takes a chink out of my um superiority in terms of the person who's in control of that conversation and I, and i don't necessarily like it <laughs> like initially <laughs> it's, it makes my life harder because i have to deal with that person in, in a specific way and then the other person the other person I'm used to dealing with people in the way that I want to because I'm the curator. So it's, I'm having to change that and it's uncomfortable, but it is, it is important. I just need to shift the way that I do my admin this end to keep up with all those different conversations. Well, but I, th so, I think that that's quite rare because I think a lot of the time, my own experience as a neurodivergent person is how many times I'm told I'm wrong. <laughs> how many times I'm told I'm doing it the wrong way and I mustn't say it like that and I mustn't do it like this and no one will understand that and it's really listening to you just now George I was quite inspired because I was thinking well actually you've just gone well this is my website and if you can't read the words well that's my experience <laughs> it's really quite difficult but I'm really admiring of it do you have anything to say about that have you experienced it where people have sort of shut you down or said that no that's not an acceptable way to to work as an artist um yes i've not as blunt as that but where i've approached organizations and this is for being queer and autistic um i find that i feel like i have to constantly um view myself but as another person yeah. How are they seeing me? Because there's been times I've uh, I've had my work censored, my text censored, or I've had my I've had proposals going to the last stages of the exhibitions being looked at in terms of going to committees to being approved whether they want to accept my work to be shown, and I'm told that my work would be offensive, or I'm told that it wouldn't be well received by an audience. Mm. It might be too specific. But also, it's down to, in terms of a show where they said, my work might be offensive. I find it quite interesting how in the gallery space where it was considered that it was acceptable to have a painting of a woman being raped by a man, but it wasn't acceptable for me to express um, how people might experience body image in queer culture that that wasn't considered acceptable even though there wasn't necessarily that much graphic material so I find that kind of dichotomy really 
bizarre. It's as though people don't want to. It's that effort and need to understand and learn different approaches. And I sometimes feel like, especially with neurodivergence, it's that that time needed to learn how to communicate with us that sometimes can cause a, a problem, especially with queer spaces where some might need Makaton or sign language in order to communicate with us because that requires time. Yeah. And time, time is a form of currency in itself. Like if you give someone else your time, that is a currency. And that's why I find it also comes down to the dominant voice. Yeah. Is what is how much of a program is going to be given to someone who might whose identity is a lot more specific and therefore how is budgets, audience, funding, how is that affected by the ability to engage with an audience if the the bit how some the audience or the the quantity of that audience is so small, how does that affect by the politics of a gallery as a result of that? Yeah, but I think as you were saying before, you know, the things that we want to talk about, the things that you want to talk about in your work, they have meaning for everybody, even if you may yourself be, you know, somewhat niche in your experience of your humanity. Um, you're also human and what you have to say is relevant to everybody in some form or another. So this 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 idea of being uh not allowed into the spaces is very short-sighted i think of a lot of arts organizations so we're coming to the end of our time here today but um i have one question i ask absolutely everybody uh which is what one thing <laughs> what one strategy do you think that our organizations could adopt to make their programs and venues more accessible and welcoming to people who are gender and or sexual variant and neurodivergent? Um, I would say... And you don't have to keep it to one if you've got better ideas than one. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got several, but they're kind of similar. I think one would be to kind of establish a report within your organisations with local communities and charities that are specific to the audience that you're trying to understand or create inclusivity around. I think specifically around neurodivergence and those who are queer, I think that welcoming, the feeling of being welcome is actually established by that being strengthened between audience, worker and the gallery. Because for example, in my local gallery, the Focal Point Gallery in South End, they've just put on the show by Ray Rosie Hastings and Hannah Quinlan, who are exploring the politics of queerness. They've created a glossary into, regarding all the terminology in queer culture, so the audience can understand it as well. And in order to make spaces more inclusive about gender neutral toilets, because people aren't aware of the kind of anxieties around how gender variants and how from my own experience as well and how that can make us feel quite unwelcome in spaces because people aren't recognizing other people's identity as such and I think it would be to regarding programs we need to really push for further intersectionality in the representation and I've noticed as well that even within LGBTQ plus platforms and charities and organisations that are campaigning for our right to self-identify no one seems to call out the ableist notions that for example how people have this negative view that autistic people don't have self-autonomy and then if that isn't given to us, then you're not affording us the same rights to self-identify either. People don't seem to understand that. And with recent news coverage around trans rights, 
the guy and a certain author who, who people consider to be transphobic in their blog, no one called out the fact that she implied that autistic people don't have self autonomy. No one called it out. Right. And it, I found, I found it quite, it was disheartening to see that no one, no major platforms specific to queer audiences were calling it out. It was actually, again, autistic people themselves who were using social media to start the trend of we are not confused to actually say I'm here I exist again yeah. we're using having to use social media to advocate for ourselves and what a lot of people don't realize is media and galleries and museums are they are almost an education portal what how if we're cur curating programs about queerness, if you aren't including people who are trans, black or disabled, your show isn't queer because the actual terminology now and how people use the word queer is about dismantling patriarchal notions that prevented these demographics from entering spaces and equity. So if you aren't tackling ableist views and you aren't showing queer exhibitions where artists are disabled it's not just about including artists who are disabled you need to make sure that the the themes that you're exploring the work you're showing actually platforms work that is about disability because as i said before like with a lot of shows around coming out or queerness they always talk about the experience of how the hiv aids crisis affected everyone but what about people who have other disabilities because yeah. that actually changes our way in how we experience coming out or our identity sometimes. It needs to be extended beyond that. Definitely, and I think that's a really powerful statement. I love that, that if you're not showing black, trans, disabled bodies experience, then your show isn't queer. I love that. <laughs> Louise, do you have anything to add or that you would like to say? Um, I mean, it's been, it's been fascinating and I think it's so multi-layered, all, uh, all of this, because even there's two distinct different um, sections for an organisation in terms of like programming and then the sort of culture and HR, for example, that you, I don't mean culture as in like the culture in the galleries, I mean the culture of the staffing and stuff. So there's two sort of different elements there's often in larger organizations as well it's that they're, they're totally different departments there's loads of different people so these sorts of changes in attitude and changes in inclusion that again we're saying it over and over it needs to come sort of like from the top and it needs to be embedded across the organization we're lucky we're, we're quite small we are even though we all have our individual jobs we're all like in you know embroiled with each other so we can make um changes and something that keeps coming up for me is about care. So the way, how do you make someone care about autistic people or queer people? You know, it's by being with those people and spending time with them and working with them because you, be, you see them as a human and you start to care. So then you start to program better for them or make your space more accessible. But if, but then how do you how do you get producers, directors, curators in organizations to spend more time with queer neurodivergent practitioners? Um, in the first place, maybe you do a fellowship, maybe you do an, you know, a, a commission. But then if people can't get through the door because your policies and your um, or your space isn't welcome, then you're not going to gauge you're not going to get that. So it's, it's complicated and it worries me that there's, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of blockers there in terms of, you know, be, becoming more inclusive for, particularly for larger organisations. Mm -hmm. There's this thing about care and caring about the public and the people we programme for and caring about our staff and our visitors and our artists. But then at the same time, care is diminishing within our sector because everybody is stressed and that, especially now you know funding you know people are skin they're um busy and yeah so there's this balance um that i'm interested in around care uh, which is my comment and 
more I talk to people, the more I sort of feel that um, it's almost like we need to do it for ourselves. But I, I recognize the, the problems around that in terms of money and venues and organization, organ, organizing ourselves. But sometimes I really feel like we need a kind of punk <laughs> attitude towards Mm. making our own work and putting our stuff out there and what you were saying earlier on George about the use of social media and using online platforms and your website and stuff maybe that that is the space to take over and to sort of express ourselves um, but that's a shame isn't it because if we if we need to feel that we can't be part of the main line main organizations and uh, venues, artists, venues, and so on. Then, then that's not a good thing. So I hope, I, I hope we do feel empowered as, as neurodivergent artists to get out there and make work. And I hope we also, with this series, are doing something towards inviting arts organisations to just invite us through the door and have conversations with us. And uh, so thank you very much. I really appreciate your your time today and uh, seeing your work and listening to your thoughts. And I have uh, so many questions I could talk to you all day. I've really loved it. Thank you. That's all right. Thanks very much.